and peace from Jesus Christ, our Savior. Please be seated. I guess it depends on where you're sitting as to whether you hear good news in today's reading. If you were there that day when Jesus started preaching, then you might think, wow, this Jesus guy, he's got a huge heart. He's everything you want in a preacher. He's kind, he's gentle. He understands the depth of human suffering in his soft words, soothe the anxious soul and comfort the grieving heart. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. And blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, revile you, defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice on that day. Leap for joy. For surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But then he gets to part two, and his eyes squint, his teeth clench, and his words harden, and he slips into attack mode. Blessings turn into curses. Love turns into anger. Sermon erupts into rant. You rich folks, you are good at working the kingdoms of this world to your advantage. Now in God's kingdom, you will be cursed. For those of you who are full, stuffed with all that you can, can be consumed in this culture, having found so many ways to satisfy your hunger, what more can God do for you? In God's coming kingdom, you shall be damned to emptiness. And wipe that smirk off your face, you self-satisfied ones. It's time you were taught some humility. I don't know if folks were surprised by the vehemence of Jesus' sermon, and if they were, they shouldn't have been surprised. After all, he wasn't saying anything new. If anyone was listening to him up to that point, before this outburst, they'd know that for him, this was pretty par for the course. This was basic stuff. You might remember in the opening song in the Gospel of Luke, Mary sings her song. It's uh, that a Messiah is coming who would cast down the mighty from their thrones, lift up the lowly. The poor are fed, the rich sent away empty. It's clear from her little tune that God takes sides that if we want to find who God is, we shouldn't be looking to the heavens, we should be looking down underneath us and all around us. It's hard to think of God taking sides. After all, God doesn't God love everyone? Didn't Jesus die for the whole world? I know how uncomfortable that sounds, but how else would you describe what Mary was saying in her song? And if that wasn't enough, think of just a few weeks ago when we heard Jesus' inaugural address where he told the folks in Nazareth that he was fulfilling what the prophet Isaiah said. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has appointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So if Jesus' sandpaper sermon came as a surprise to his disciples, they weren't paying attention or they simply chose not to hear him. But they were awake now. No one was snoozing through this sermon. There were grumblings from the front row, but cheering was erupting from the cheap seats. And this was different from the way Matthew tells the story. Matthew only has part one of Jesus' sermon. He includes the blessings but leaves out the curses. He points to heaven as a reward for putting up with a small, pitiful human existence, and then the rich get off scot-free. At least in this portion of Matthew's version. We call Matthew's version of the story we heard, we call that the Sermon on the Mount because he goes to a high place and he preaches to the crowd so everyone can see and hear him. And we call Luke's version the Sermon on the Plain because Jesus stands eye level to those who are listening to him. And that's no accident. That's an intentional theological distinction. Luke's Jesus tends to walk among the people where Matthew's Jesus seems just a little bit more lofty. 
Also in Matthew's version of the story, Jesus is preaching to huge crowds who came out to hear him. They made an effort to come and hear him. In Luke's version, he's almost pushing people away. He finishes his sermon meant for mass consumption and that where he preached from the boat, and then he huddled with his disciples to give his blessings and his woes. They're the ones intended to hear this sermon. Anyone else would have to listen from a distance. And the blessings and curses they hear with an earshot. Luke has his distinction of seeming to glory in Jesus' sayings about poor people being lifted up and rich folks getting run over by some divine steamroller. A lot more than the other Gospels. And some theologians have picked up on this and even made a term for this. They call it God's preferential option for the poor. I know. I don't know about you, but that kind of rubs me the wrong way. It tells me that I'm not at the top of God's priority list, that God's preference is for someone else. I may not be living high off the hog, but to many folks around the world, and even to some here in Calgary, I'm living pretty large. So where does that leave me? And does this tell me that because I won the cosmic lottery and was born into a part of the world that is fairly economically stable, and I grew up in a family where I didn't have to worry about where I was going to sleep or what I was going to eat, and that because I had access to good education and a doctor was just a quick phone call away, that I somehow get penalized for that? Does this tell me that I'm cursed for working in a decent paying job and for having a good looking resume? Does this tell me that all my hard work means nothing? And when I look for the scriptures for an explanation, trying to figure out what God is up to, I'm left with these cold, hard words. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Matthew says poor in spirit. Luke just says poor. That leaves me out. But there's no wiggling out of it. Try as I might, I need to take the Bible seriously. And the Bible tells me that Jesus spent most of his time with people who were dirt poor, folks who were pushed to the edges of this world. He had little time for people who wanted everyone to think they had it all together and lived in comfortable respectability. In fact, Jesus straight said flat out, he said, beware when people speak well of you. It certainly doesn't make it easy to be a Christian, does it? So, Okay. Just so we're clear, Jesus, are you saying that my master's degree and all the toilet effort that went into building my career means nothing? You could say that. Are you saying that working hard to put a roof over my kid's head and food in their mouths, like sushi yesterday, very good, is sheer silliness in God's eyes? Maybe. Are you saying that all the time and effort I put into building relationships, nurturing community, that all counts for nothing in the kingdom of God? You're missing the point, Jesus would say. Why would God show up when God isn't needed? Why would God bother with those who already have what they want? Why would the great physician go where no one needs healing? If you want to look and see where God is, Look in the eyes of the teenager who is dying of cancer. Look at the swelled belly of a starving child in Africa. Look at the clenched fist of the man who just buried his wife. There is the kingdom of God. If you want to see where God is, just look at the refugee who lost everything and is trying to hold his family together by the most meager of means. Look at the couple who look across the dinner table at each other, quietly knowing that their marriage is over. Look at the prisoner who is spending the best years of her life in jail because of one mistake. Look at the guy who lost his job and hasn't a clue what to do next. There is the kingdom of God. If you want to see where God is, look beyond your own comfort. Immerse yourself in a world that is not of your own making. Listen to unfamiliar voices. Hear unpopular opinions. Expose yourself to unconventional thinking. There is the kingdom of God. Then look in your own heart. 
Run your hand along the cracks. Cracks that you tried to tell yourself weren't there. Cracks that you tried to hide from others and yourself. Cracks that threatened to break you open, but are held together with denial and shame. Goes behind the public presentation that makes it look like to others that you have your life together is a hidden sadness that longs to be healed. There is the kingdom of God. And that's when Jesus steps in and blessings and woes converge and the world begins to change. Your world begins to change. The greedy open up their wallets and give, not until it hurts, but until it feels good. The grieving sing songs of gladness. The hungry sidle up to the all-you-can-eat buffet. The dying put their feet on the ground and stand upright. Shame turns to confidence. Poverty bursts into abundance. Sadness gives birth to joy. There is the kingdom of God. Because out of the curses of life, God creates blessings. Out of the woes that threaten us, Jesus molds into a consecration. Out of the crosses we bear every day, God brings resurrection. Because our death is God's final benediction. Because we are not the source of our own hope. As much as we like to think of ourselves as self-reliant, hardworking people, Jesus is saying that God is more interested in our wounds than in our wins. He is drawn to our limitations more than our victories. He identifies more with our weakness than our strength. Jesus is saying that God cares more for our grief and our sorrow than our achievements and successes because God knows how fleeting they can be and that the achievements and successes that last are between people. How deeply we connect, how we help each other flourish, how we grow together into who God wants us to be how we share our intimate moments that grow into deeper understanding of each other. Jesus is most interested in us when we are broken, limited, sinful, and struggling, long before we receive or even want him, because that's where God's best work is done. Where we would put ourselves down and put each other down, Jesus bends down to lift us up, and he asks that we do the same. Where we heap judgment and blame and shame upon each other and ourselves, Jesus tenderly forgives and accepts us and asks that we follow his example. When we are filled with despair or sorrow, Jesus loves us with a love that renews us and puts us on the path of healing, and he asks that we share in each other's renewal. Because the kingdom of God that Jesus talks about in Luke isn't the realm of the highest heaven where people enjoy eternal bliss. It's not about angels and clouds or harps or halos. In fact, he's talking about the opposite of all that. The kingdom of God that Jesus talks about in Luke is located at the base of human existence. It resides deep in the human heart. It is the union between people and God. The blessings and woes were about how we human beings draw lines between each other. And Jesus erases those lines with his call for justice and equity. It's a recognition that as God's people created in love, the temptations of this world are to pull people apart. And that Jesus' vision is that people are brought together in the great diversity of creation where all people are recognized for who they are and are being transformed into the likeness of the one who called everything into being. Jesus' vision for this world is where all people live and thrive in the abundance that God has created. Because that's when we will receive God's final blessing. And may this be so among us. Amen.